So thank, thank, thanks to her for, for more the, uh, uh, getting back to normal and life is returning. If you could, to, if you could unmute, please. Uh, uh, we we yeah, hear you. Yesterday we had some announcements from the government about uh, what to expect oh, during the winter winter period. Who is speaking? So we are quite, uh, let's say, nervous and uh, very cautious. <laughs> Yeah, because last last year was quite. Uh, Krishna, was Krish, quite Krishna, uh, Krishna, mm -hmm. could you please unmute? He's uh, surviving. He's Thank you very much. Indeed, yeah. especially for the Christmas break and uh, winter break. Yeah, winter period quite challenging. Uh, well. So well, I would like I would like just to start with the usual uh, usual I would say rules for WebEx meeting. So as as you hear, well, please avoid to to have conversations uh, <laughs> being muted because otherwise it will be like a, a tower of Babel. We will not uh, be able to to communicate. So please please uh, mute yourself, and only only uh, mute when you are uh, willing to, to speak. I would like also to stress that maybe uh, due to the bandwidth, uh, well. Just, just put your your camera on when you are uh, actually willing to pose questions or where you where, where, when you are speaking. Uh, for the for the speakers, um, as we agreed, uh, you will be able to share uh, your your presentation. So I will not deal with them uh, unless unless uh, requested. So I'm happy to to welcome you today this morning. We'll have, uh, two hours and a half discussions on a topic which is quite. Uh, uh, quite sensitive. Well, as you have seen from uh, the uh, introduction of this workshop, um, the reaction was both related to the events that took place in uh, in July uh, in uh, Germany and, and and Belgium, and owing to the fact that uh, there were some uh, information provided by well some some uh, uh, mapping uh, mapping projects and uh, research projects that enabled enabled to forecast impacts before the events that were communicated to the uh, civil protection and actually the communication is not not, uh, not appropriate and what is very frustrating is that we are uh, we are in a situation please unmute please unmute your 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 microphone please thank you yeah so so the the frustration is that uh, we are um, well advanced with respect to impact forecasting at a system and so on, research-wise, but that we see that the governance, the decision-making process, uh, is is still problematic because we cannot really uh, we, we, we failed really to to communicate this information uh, in time, and this is still life, and this is well not 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 acceptable. So this is uh, certainly at the core of uh, many topics that are being uh, proposed by the uh, disaster within society thematic area of the civil security um, uh, civil so security for society program and I, I would like actually to to debate with you to discuss with you um, what are really the potential of uh, space uh, application space based application in the different DRS uh, projects you will see i will make a short presentation just uh, recalling a little bit which are the topics where space-based uh, applications have been quoted. And I will uh, give the floor to uh, different speakers as I will I will share my slides now. Uh, as you will see, um, I, I've chosen uh, views from first responders, from uh, service providers, uh, research and development, and then uh, exchanging with you about questions that you might have um, I would say on not on the topic itself because we are not entitled to discuss the topics uh, the, during actually because the call is open, but really really the interactions between disaster risk reduction and space based based application, and how we could in fact uh, do much much better in the context of the uh, current call and maybe later if we are if we have possibilities to uh, integrate uh, this in a future work program. I will now share my slides and uh, make um, make a short presentation just just to to refresh a little bit our mind regarding um, so let me see it's, um, 
Do you see my slides? Yeah, I see it. Hi, Philip. Okay. Okay. Very good. Okay. So, so I will, I will uh, actually just make a very quick um, reminder about the, 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 well, why, why we are so uh, discussing today about the DRS topics, which they are, and uh, this will certainly help our discussions further on. And well, sorry, I'm sorry Philip. Sorry to interrupt, yes? but. Um, I think you are sharing the wrong screen because I see the presenter view and not the full screen view of the text. Let me see. Share. Share. Try to share the other display. I will. I will stop sharing and see. Yes. See. I will try to try again. Sorry. Uh, display setting. Now it's, it's still showing the the presenter's version. Uh, presenter version. So I don't I don't know how. So can I? Uh, can I? Well, this is. Uh, you can uh, change it on the. Uh, If you if you use display settings uh, during during uh, the the cast presentation, yeah. if you click on display settings, you can switch between the two screens. So you can access it quickly. And the issue is that yeah. If you untick use presenter view, if you don't need um, it, you can yeah. untick this box use presenter view, and it will work. In fact, I'm lost in the, in the, in the, so let me see. I will start again. Well, sorry for that. This is my, because now I cannot see. Oh. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe I will, uh, Maybe I will ask, uh, is it okay now or not? Display setting. So, well, as I can, per, see, it now. I can see what you're presenting. Exactly. Yeah? Click on this one. Yeah. Okay. Is it okay now? Yeah, now it's okay. Oh, Great. Okay, perfect. Great job. Sorry for this, for this phrase. Okay, so, so well. Uh, I will I will uh, simply introduce very quickly the agenda. So uh, as you see, as you have seen, we will have uh, uh, some introductory views from uh, Zoltan on Copernicus, and we will have speakers uh, um, uh, giving us some insight into the uh, uh, B alert system and uh, service provider from from Predict in France, and uh, then uh, views from uh, the I would say space based application that is from from Thales Digital Factory from Veronique and Frederic. And then from research by by Daniel, and then we'll have some questions and answers during the um, during the during the workshop um, and open discussions at, at the end. Don't hesitate to to post questions to the speakers via the chat because uh, while there will be uh, some interaction there, and uh, when when we will be reaching the question and answer response, you will be welcome to to post your questions and and put your video on. So I would like to simply recall that we are uh, dealing with the cluster three of the Horizon Europe um, uh, pro program that is on civil security for society. And here uh, we, we are supporting mainly the security union strategy, um, new, new pact on migration and asylum. But in the case of DRS, uh, mainly the EU disaster risk reduction policies, new EU climate adaptation strategy and uh, well, I would say parent legislation like, uh, for example, uh, flood directive, uh, union civil protection mechanism, and so on. So here, really, the expected impact on this thematic area is to enhance disaster management. And in this respect, well, the, the four all program have different 
what we call not destinations, you know, well, if I call that thematic areas, but it's destination, destination um, of which the disaster resilience society is part of them. So you, you see fight against crime and terrorism, border management, resilient infrastructure, which is now including in fight uh, against crime and terrorism, and then the horizontal um, destination, which is related to strengthen security research and innovation, basically funding for site studies, uh, networking, uh, and so on. So I'm focusing today, this morning, on disaster resilient societies. And in this respect, I will, you will get the slides. So don't, don't, uh, and, and this is an extract of the introduction of the work program. So I, in, I invite you to, to read very carefully the work program if you need to, to, to have more. I would like simply to stress here that in the destination, we are focusing on enhanced capacities in risk and resilience management, as well as governance. We are looking at uh, intersectorial cooperation, involvement of different sectors, actors. We really want to uh, gather policy makers, scientists, industry, uh, SMEs, public administrations, scientists, practitioners, and so on. Well, it's quite ambitious, but we want really to have all the sectors working together. We focus, obviously, on the implementation of international policy initiatives, in particular, the Sendai Framework for Action and uh, EU Disaster Risk Reduction uh, Policies. And this requires cross-border, cross-sectorial cooperation, collaboration among actors, and so on. Uh, we want really to have integrated approaches to bridge different policy areas. And you will see that today, uh, this bridge between, I would say, uh, classical uh, modeling, uh, uh, well, alert system, tools, mapping, and so on, can be actually very well connected to space-based uh, space applications. We did not really, uh, in the past, have uh, focused projects which were involving space-based uh, applications. So it's maybe uh, a good opportunity for us to, to see how we could uh, integrate this knowledge into, uh, into this uh, area of science. So it's why we were, uh, we were requested by, uh, by DigiGro and DigiDefis in particular that we in encourage uh, the primary use of Copernicus data services and technologies um, when there are proposals which uh, involve Earth observation, it's not it's not an obligation per se because you will see that if you have if if there are some proposals which are not dealing uh, at all with this, obviously we will not request uh, uh, these applications to be to be used. But when there are Earth observation, we encourage this um, this use. And if projects use satellite satellite based positioning navigation and or relating timing data and services, well, the proposals have to uh, use Galileo, EGNOs, and other data, which can be additionally uh, been used. And the use of Copernicus is again encouraged. So this is something which is a standard text, which has been put in several topics, not, not only in DRS, uh, I have to say. If you look at the work program, uh, there are several topics which are also including this uh, standard uh, standards text in uh, the uh, fight, fight against crime and terrorism, and uh, as well as the border management. So it's not something that we are putting uh, the, the, uh, clearly in front in the scope of the project, but as a kind of warning, a kind of eligibility criteria, if um, projects are indeed looking at Earth observation. So, in this respect, I will pass very quickly because it's not my purpose to present. Please unmute, unmute your your microphone, please. I, I hear I hear a parallel conversation. Thank you. So, so I will pass very quickly the different topics uh, without without any details, just to give you a flavor on where we uh, have considered that space-based applications might be useful. And the first one uh, for 2021 is about societal resilience. That is really to improve understanding of risk exposures, public awareness in areas uh, exposed to multi-hazards. And you have well understood that, for example, in, in, in July in, in the, with the flash flood event, this risk awareness has been has been very weakly, uh, I would say, perceived by even by citizens and local authorities. So we want to to really make a, a step forward the development of local, national, and international uh, strategies uh, in this respect. And in, this is includes preparedness. So here 
we have to 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 look whether indeed space-based uh, applications may be, uh, be may be useful. The uh, second area, which sub area, which is considered in in, in DRS, uh, is, uh, is dealing with improved disaster risk management and governance. And here, certainly, uh, the governance aspects have to be very very closely looked at. And in particular, to uh, I would say uh, the, in the area of integrated disaster risk reduction for extreme climate events, and here it's clearly the the scope of the discussion certainly today about about climate extremes, and uh, what what we can do uh, with respect to better governance throughout the entire disaster risk management cycle. Another one, which is also looking at um, disaster risk uh, capabilities, adaptive uh, capabilities, are looking not only on scenario building, but also on historical data. That is, here we are typically in the area of what did we learn as, as lessons? And certainly what happened this summer will be, uh, unfortunately, dramatic lessons to be learned. And what uh, what we can actually extract as um, as a memory from the past, because you know that we tend to to forget a little bit the uh, ancient memories, while uh, even some uh, uh, would say data from uh, last centuries could be still useful for our uh, modern management. So it is really about this. Then in uh, 2021, we have also an area which is called strength and capacity of first and second responders. And here, the one that we have chosen it, um, is related to deployed mobile laboratories to enhance situational awareness for pandemics and emerging infectious diseases. Well, unfortunately, we are still uh, not out from the from the pandemics. And this is uh, quite a hot topic, and we we need really to to see how we can make an improvement in this respect to be more effective on uh, detecting actually pandemic and emerging uh, infectious disease risk. So here again, uh, I wonder whether indeed space-based applications might have a role. This is for 2021, and in next year uh, we will have another call uh, published. Uh, like 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 this year in June 2022 with deadline in November 22. So here, looking at preparedness for high impact, low probability or unexpected events, we have to indeed look at uh, uh, something which could be unexpected, just like climate change risk, but cyber threats, infectious disease and tourism. Well, we we are never prepared of uh, about the the, the, the events uh, as we have noticed in fact in uh, in uh, in Belgium and Germany there, there were no no preparation for this kind of event while in other countries which are maybe more faced to to risk like for example earthquake in uh, uh, in Italy or or even this Mediterranean flash flood events in the southeast of France they are actually uh, more prepared. Uh, they will not avoid the event the events to to occur, but at least uh, regarding the protection of citizens, uh, the, the preparedness level is maybe higher. So here we want really to have something uh, better discussed at EU level, and it is the aim of this topic. Uh, improved quality assurance, quality control for data used in decision making, and this this is concerning both natural hazards, uh, accidents, and severe events, and this is clearly to ensure that. Data that are used for um, modeling um, can be uh, uh, impact uh, impact forecasting modeling or uh, the, or uh, uh, alert system and so on are of proven quality, and it's not only um, it's 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 very of it's mostly related to measurements which are observations, which can be can can lead to uh, to false I would say positive. On negative responses, we want to be sure that data that are provided to decision makers are of proven accuracy. So um, it will be covering a wide range of um, type of activities. We have one project which is looking we're looking at biotoxins, for example, the uh, Eurobiotox, and here they are going deep into the in depth into the I would say the metrological science with proficiency testing. Uh, reference materials. Maybe we don't need proficiency testing for all the areas, but at least we need to have quality assurance protocol that ensure that these data are of demonstration quality. Um, so this in uh, the uh, disaster risk management and governance, we have also uh, again proje uh, project on improved um, impact forecasting early warning system 
to uh, help rapid deployment of first responding vulnerable areas. And here we have a, a quite a strong legacy in uh, the area of extreme weather uh, events. And we would like to have actually um, this type of approach also extended to other type of natural hazards, in particular geo hazards. And we would like to see uh, how we could really not anticipate the event, but having maybe studies on precursors, you know, impact forecasting that might um, help, in fact, first to enhance preparedness and help the first responders to um, uh, quickly uh, deploy when, when an event is, is, is eating. So then uh, the last one is re related to CBRN events, and this is uh, again on situational awareness, preparedness of first responders to uh, minimize the time to react in case of a CBRN event. It's a little bit the same philosophy as yeah, the, the last one on natural hazard. It's really to ensure that we have the proper you know, information uh, and, uh, and, and preparedness uh, capabilities before the event, so that so that uh, when when an event occurs, there is in fact a very very efficient response by by the responders. So all all these topics are actually very focused on on applied uh, research, applied uh, uh, applied technologies, applied tools, me methods, and so on to raise awareness of citizens to respond to have a better preparedness, a more efficient response, and so on. So we are really working. Um, regarding the civil protection to 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 uh, to support actually the current policies. So now I would like to to pass the floor actually and entering into the debate the very very uh, I would say practical uh, information that will be provided by our speakers and uh, um, well I have a debate with you on what are the uh, opportunities and what what could be uh, what could be envisaged to. To, uh, to have uh, better connections between different actors. Um, I will be facilitating the discussions. I'm uh, uh, learning as well uh, as many as many of you are in this in this area, and I will be very curious to discover what you what you will be presenting to us. So I would like to to uh, uh, to invite actually um, Zoltan to to share uh, his slides, and we will uh, then start with with this presentation. If there are questions now, well, you can you can maybe uh, have uh, burning burning questions. You can pose them now, or you use the chat, and I will be happy to to respond um, uh, via, via the chat. Beautiful lion, Zoltan. Thanks very much. That's our family old family coat of arms. Re wow! Wow! It's, it's a mix. It's it's a mix between scorpion and, and lion. This is quite interesting. Very sharp eyes. You are one of the very few you will realize that. Yes, it's a man. Well, it's it's it because it's because I'm I'm lion by zodiac sign. So and uh, and I I have a very good friend with scorpion. So I'm I'm very uh, I am uh, very keen of astrology. So it's something which is uh, quite obvious. So thank you, thank you for being with us. And I will uh, pass you the floor. Uh, thank you, can, you very you much. Chat. I have to say that the same situation uh, at us, uh, a scorpion and a lion is forming together and founded the company together. Uh, okay. Little addition that we are married to. But... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. Back to business. Um, I'm Zoltan Seike. And uh, before uh, doing my own company, Seike Family and Company, uh, I was first responder for 20 years serving in the armed forces, at border guards, at police, and at disaster management. Um, I was responsible for the National Disaster Response Drill Game Master position for, for uh, more than half a decade. And um, I am also carried out Horizon 2020 projects in disaster resilience and security. Uh, then I moved to the European Space Agency and worked as technology transfer specialist uh, before working in our own way. And Space for Security is our program. Uh, we are implementing various space uh, solutions, um, including Copernicus, but not uh, restricted to Copernicus, to support the work of uh, my uh, and our former colleagues. To jump into the middle, uh, the Copernicus is uh, actually not only um, satellite imagery or Earth observation uh, service. It's a complex information service. 
it covers these uh, six thematic areas which are strongly overlapping and interrelating with each other. It's climate change, marine monitoring, atmosphere monitoring, land monitoring, security and emergency management. And you see that security and emergency management are more horizontal type of services and climate change, marine uh, monitoring, atmosphere and land are more like vertical services providing information uh, for everyone, from uh, decision makers down to farmers, fishermen, uh, everyday people, and uh, mo and uh, most important, this climate change uh, supervision is allowing us critical foresight on what is uh, what will happen in the next decades, because uh, we cannot evade. The climate change we can just adapt to it so this service composes of course of satellites they are the flagships of the service but it's these satellites are extended with ground segments these are ground control stations and stations responsible for calibration and uh, uh, recovering of data um, it's extended by ground and aerial monitoring so usually the satellite earth observation data is fused uh, with uh, ground measure data um, or aerial monitor data, we call it in situ data, or it is located uh, at the uh, location of interest LOI, as we as we as we call it. Um, the Copernicus also provides uh, core geo information service because uh, it's basically quite a difficult mathematical uh, formula to determine what piece of Earth is actually satellite looking, and uh, therefore the Copernicus services provides a fusion of satellite imagery with uh, global positioning. And uh, nowadays we can also speak on, on Galileo positioning. And provides us a so-called uh, spatial temporal localization of uh, the data. We know where and when did uh, the satellite collect that image. And the best news, uh, especially for users who are not uh, um, highly trained or highly experienced in, in uh, processing satellite information, uh, there is a complex information and data management system. There are portals of Copernicus. I really encourage you uh, to have a look into those portals. Uh, many services of these portals are available uh, to the public freely or uh, available after registration. I will give you some examples uh, in the next uh, few slides at the end of my presentation. And uh, the, uh, well, there are some services which are restricted, of course, but I will, I will go into details with that. The most interesting part of uh, the uh, Copernicus services, of course, is the so-called space segment, which composes of various satellites uh, orbiting around the planet Earth. Uh, they are two big uh, group of satellites, two big pillars of satellites. One is the Sentinels, which is called the Sentinel mission. There are six Sentinel missions ongoing, although Sentinel-4 mission will be only launched, planned to be launched next year, 2022. Uh, but the simulation of how the data can be used and what the data will be structured is already ongoing uh, in partnership uh, with Airbus, uh, ESA partnership with Airbus. And uh, the other, uh, not exactly fully operational satellite is Sentinel-5, because Sentinel-5 currently has its precursor mission running, Sentinel-5B. The other sets, uh, Sentinel-1, uh, a and B represents a pair of satellites. That's a small constellation because this is how they can uh, provide regular revisit and, and coverage. Sentinel 1A and 1B is working uh, with a synthetic aperture radar. So they are seeing through clouds and any other obstacles. They are actually mapping uh, Earth's surface on a C-band uh, synthetic aperture radar. Uh, there are polar orb orbiting satellites, by the, by the way. So they're quite reliant uh, and uh, weather resilient. It doesn't really matter what the weather is, they will provide imagery. 
Sentinel-2 is an MSI multispectral instrument, so that's more traditionally close to the satellite image we are used to to see as as uh, uh, ordinary people or or uh, users and users uh, using a Pashbroom concept. So this is going uh, all around, and then with uh, tools like Aza Snap tool, we can decide what bandwidths we want to see. For example, if I want to see the uh, the nature uh, vegetation density index, how thick uh, the the chlorophyll is present at a given location. I have to select uh, um, some specific bandwidths to monitor to get that picture. Sentinel-3 is uh, about surface topography uh, and temperature. It's one of the uh, latest latest launches. Uh, uses like uh, OLCI and, and radiometer instruments, as well as altimeters uh, to provide us information about how the surface of Earth is, is changing, especially its temperature, which is one of the most important keys now. Sentinel-4 recovers some uh, uh, meteorological instruments, MTGI and MTG uh, sound, MTGS. Uh, but um, to be honest, uh, I do, do not like to speak about capabilities of satellites which are not yet launched because first let's let's have it in orbit and let's see what instruments are actually working after the launch. Um, 5P is a high res spectrometer, uh, especially goes well with uh, UV and near infrared uh, bandwidths, um, giving you information about how the atmosphere looks like, so what ozone concentration, nitrogen dioxide concentration silicon dioxide concentration, and, and so on and so on. And uh, important to also mention that Copernicus has contributing missions. Because the Copernicus Information Service does not only consist of, uh, of the, Sentinel, the Sentinel fleet. Since uh, 19... Uh, 72, they are contributing missions to, to the Copernicus Information Services. And those contributing missions allowed by different operators, including NASA or, or private companies like Verview, uh, are uh, providing data to the, Copernicus, to, to the Copernicus Services. They are organizing different groups. I will not go into this, uh, uh, this group distribution but I can provide you more detailed information about what kind of satellites are in which groups, because uh, it can happen that uh, based on your specific data need or the scope of your proposal or objectives, you will not only need uh, Sentinel data, but you will also need uh, focused uh, data from one of the contributing satellites because of revisit date, uh, sensor alignment, et cetera, et cetera. But what kind of data can you get? Uh, you can get uh, the so-called level zero data product, uh, products. Uh, that's data which is not provided to the public. Um, this uh, works with, for example, with the flexible dynamic block adaptive quantization, this FDBAQ. This is raw data. So you, you, we will need an SAR processor uh, to, to process it and understand what the data is. When is this important? You, you have to specifically ask for this data uh, to have it, especially it is especially important if you will need to check and confirm additional data, which will otherwise not be present in processed data. Uh, small error margins, very small under pixel uh, uh, spatial temporal resolution cases and so on and so on. Um, level one is already time referenced and uh, an ancillary information. So you know, these levels are quite a standard in the space industry, though the American and the European level definitions uh, are not fully aligned, but but uh, mostly aligned. The Americans have have some A one A one B one C levels does not apply for all satellites. Um, so that's georeference. You will see where the satellite was in orbit when the picture was taken, and that what what the uh, area of interest was the satellite cloth brushing through uh, or blooming uh, 
uh, with the swath of sensors. Uh, level two already have derived geophysical variables. Uh, that's already providing you also the surface height, oceanographic position, and um, and that's the first level which is uh, almost ready to process on a map. But uh, what the, the most everyday users uh, end users can can have most benefit from are level three and level four outputs data products because level three is already is, is on a uniform time space grid. So it is already like like you can put it on the on an open street map overlay uh, or on a Google map overlay and you can work with that because it is fully georeferenced. It's made consistent. Uh, so puzzles of the pictures taken by the satellite, the series of pictures is collated into fully covered area because sometimes if you uh, select an area of interest, uh, maybe this will not consist of a single satellite picture, but it has to be composed of three, four, even five pictures, especially if you use small contributions uh, satellites with small swaths of sensors. And the four is uh, already annotated model output or results from analysis, just like the FIS data, for example, from, from Copernicus. Uh, I will show you some examples, and when I'm showing examples, I will tell you which level of data is, is present. Uh, basically, uh, for uh, everyday end users, this level for model output is mostly used nowadays or accessed nowadays. Uh, but if we go into research innovation to really unlock the, the power of satellite imagery, uh, we have to go to these levels. Uh, level three for sure, but I also strongly encourage everyone to try to dig into the lower levels as much as possible, because there is where you can make a real, real breakthrough on how to use uh, these, this information uh, com coming down uh, from space. I I'll show here all, all the levels just to make it make it full. Feel free to, to check out with me if you want to know about each specific level, how to align that with your objectives or, or proposal needs. Uh, my experience as first responder is why we need data. First, we do need data for risk assessment and our anal risk analysis models. Just think on the risk and recovery mapping of Copernicus or think uh, again uh, on the CRAM, which was uh, introduced by first in border management, but then was taken over to disaster response by some specific projects and was adapted for critical infrastructures. Um, we need early warning and detection like the EFIS, uh, the European Flood Warning System. Uh, have a better situational awareness that's called rapid mapping, but when it's a disaster is ongoing or we are on the on the uh, response phase. Uh, then this service can be requested by authorities entitled authorities from ESA, and then they will receive targeted pictures. So the satellites will be tasked to do more detailed swaths and scans on the area specifically. Uh, that's that's a great, great power. Uh, in, in the hand of the authorities uh, because because a situation in an ongoing disaster uh, can change from from one hour to the other. So a strong satellite tasking can be envisaged. And um, and at the disaster site, it can happen that most of the in-situ sensors or the communication uh, networks behind those sensors are disabled or destroyed or damaged beyond operation. You can do damage and loss assessments in the FP7 framework program. We did some some uh, use cases on how you can use damage and loss assessment uh, with with help of satellites. Uh, but uh, at that time, the Copernicus services was, was in its early years. So I really think that uh, a good revision, especially a comparison with historical data, will be will be very nice. I really hope that someone is is on this on this topic. And um, and the coordination of recovery and relief, uh, that's another very hard topic for first responders, because first responders and authorities are hold responsible for most of things, even what people are doing, everyday people are doing, or NGOs or self-organized groups are doing uh, in the recover, as a recovery and relief attempt. And sometimes these interests do align with each other, 
thanks God, most in most of the cases, disaster response, that's the case. But we have seen cases like in border management when those uh, are not really aligned or opposing each other. And in a disaster resilient case, like in a case of a pandemic, uh, the best is to uh, best is to uh, prevent those. Last but not least, uh, my conclusion is uh, based on my 20 years experience that this in this age of climate adaptation, there will be a new old first responder. People. Because there will not be always time or capacity for the states and state authorities and local authorities to respond on time. Just think on the German flood. People were just sitting back and oh no problem, the authorities will release us. And and they then they drowned, actually. No. In this new age of resilience, uh, we have been really strongly pushing uh, towards individual disaster resilience capabilities. Of course, not everyone does need to be a superhero, but you need to be aware and be ready to move, be ready to react, be ready to respond as a first responder. Save yourselves, save your family, um, and, and save the other people, uh, whoever you can, without risking your lives. Of course, we cannot expect people to act, every, everyone as a first responder, but it will be just like in old times, uh, when a fire happened in the, in the medieval city, everyone was going to extinguish the fire. Uh, and this age is coming again, and that will be the new normal, that we respond together and don't only wait for, for authorities. And last but least, let me provide you uh, just as a fire starter to talk on, uh, on use cases, how uh, satellite data can or could have been help in case of uh, uh, happened cases. Um, I've tried to pin out use cases which are not really aligned with, not, with any of the topics. Um, if there are any strong, strong overlap, that's not intentional. I've tried to provide some neutral ex uh, examples. Um, and for this sake, uh, those are not yet scientifically validated examples. So pardon, uh, pardon for this. Well, you know, the Leverkusen accident uh, on 27th of July, um, 740 UTC, there was a blast in, in a, in a nest, industri German industrial park uh, in Leverkusen uh, near Köln. And uh, what was uh, terrifying that uh, we had a, a strong buildup in the area of, of uh, carbon monoxide buildup, which was unusual for this region at the time. So the Copernicus Atmospheric Monitoring Services uh, already detected some carbon monoxide buildup at midnight the same day, a UTC, and in seven and a half hours, an explosion followed. Why can I say that uh, this is unusual? It is not unusual for these areas, which are heavily populated and heavily industrialized, that there is a high carbon monoxide level. But if you have a look all around the atmospheric uh, conditions, if someone has a, has experience in in uh, checking out atmospheric example model, that's not normal. That shouldn't be here. This all should be blue, because there is no geographical hill or anything which could which should should indicate why this is here. So if if anyone that's that's here is the uh, the arrow for it. And uh, let's show you a normal comparison. When, when there is a general wind direction that the, uh, the uh, carbon monoxide level is higher, of course, this is presented as well. But there is a much higher general level. So I think that that really, really worth a smaller, smaller research or some interest. And the, the German flood, which was definitely addressed in the in the letter of invitation uh, by Philip, so I, I took as a as a strong recommendation to include this case study. Um, and I have to tell you that the flood forecast system of Copernicus was perfectly forecasting the the over ninety percent chance of a flood around this area. So. Problem was not in the 
satellite forecast or foresight. It was about uh, response, uh, awareness of the population, and preparative measures. For example, the Netherlands went away almost without damage because uh, already before they reversed uh, uh, the, the, they restored the wetlands, the plains where the water was able to flow, flow out. And uh, sorry, but no satellite can save us if we are not prepared or if we are not ready to act. Okay, so we can do many things, guys, but we, we can't change change the future or the past. So it's time to act. Thank you. That was that was all. I already see that Philip has uh, reactivated his camera, so I think my time is up. Um, I've tried to be as short as possible. Uh, if you want to be involve us in any of your proposals or uh, as some ideas and want want us aboard, here are my contacts. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn or drop drop me as email or you can find me through Philip because because uh, we we went through already uh, on some DRS projects together. Um, and thank you very much for the attentions. And uh, looking forward to to work with you on some some specific topics in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ultan. This was very interesting. Well, uh, I have uh, I have learned things that I did not did not did not know. So so thank you very much for that. It's uh, always always uh, refreshing to have a, a general overview like that. So thank you, thank you very much. There, there have been some some uh, some remarks on the on the chat. Uh, well, from Gabriel uh, asking asking you how long it takes uh, uh, for rapid uh, mapping. What what does it mean rapid ma mapping? And Javier mentioned that while well, the satellite data are not only uh, useful for first responders but also for private uh, companies for risk management surveillance and so on and gerhard uh, mentioned and i agree with fully with the, with with with, uh, with, the, with him that uh, products need to be provided uh, to first responders and not research prototypes and uh, and it's very often what uh, we are we have the illusion sometimes that when we have a research project that are de delivering very very useful and efficient tools that they will be transmitted but if they are not really on the market they will not be provided to first responders so so it's something that we need to to look at very very carefully on this i would say uh, post uh, post research phase which is going uh, to innovation and to the market so, so maybe, mapping, maybe, yeah, 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 please. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, your sound please, is a bit delayed, so I, I thought that you, you already uh, start ask, ask me on this. Uh, just have a look. There is a very simple uh, general mapping. This is available for public or any 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 company. Uh, that's the use use case. Now we do have uh, an, an uh, do had a forest fire in August in Greece. Actual uh, events. That's an open wildfire here. Uh, we had an incident on 5th of September, so there is the there is the uh, quick mapping activities. Uh, but if you want to use the active mapping, uh, then you need to be a um, first responder authority. Uh, but some general information will be available for for all of us. But. Uh, if you check out who can use this service, you can see. I, I maybe I, I launch it, launch it, so you can see it better. Uh, if you're an authorized user, then you send an SRF uh, to the ERCC, and they will position the satellite in your well, not the satellite, but the the, swap, the sensors in your favor. Uh, you see that authorized users include national focal points. For example, in Hungary, this is the General Directorate of Disaster Management. Uh, every member state does have a designated NFP, National Focal Point. So if you are a research entity does or not an authorized user, but you need this data, you should you should involve your NFP. And um, and uh, you every directory general, of course, is entitled, uh, as well as EU delegations and the situational room is is entitled to to use it. And you can be, if you are not in this list, then you can be an associated user. Some of these are, are being pointed here. Hope hope I answered the question, uh, Philip. Thank you. Thank you, Zoltan. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. We will move forward. I see that uh, uh, that there are questions uh, from, from Klaus about the key for a request uh, to, to the market. Uh, I would like to, 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 
to keep these discussions for the end because you will uh, see an example certainly given by by Daniel about uh, about procurement and actually what he did for a forecast impact forecast system. I I, I suppose that Daniel will will say a few words about this, and this is something that needs really to be to be indeed discussed and and actually uh, examined by us because we are dealing with research in our program, but there are also some uh, uh, procurement uh, possibilities regarding funding. We did not yet look at this in the um, natural hazard disaster risk uh, the, uh, reduction area. It's something that we will discuss at the end of the workshop. Now, I'll, I would like to, to move to Alessandro, um, Alessandro Lazzari. And and Kun Debut. So so I understand Alessandro that you will have uh, uh, two um, two different uh, presentations. So so please keep keep it uh, in your time so that we we are we are not not uh, delaying too much the the discussion. So Alessandro, uh, can you share your your slides? Yeah, thanks very much for giving me the floor, Philippe. I hope you can hear me. Yeah. And uh, ask confirmation when you can see my screen. Yeah. Yes, perfect. Yeah, thank you thank very you. much indeed for inviting me over. A quick introduction uh, from my side. I'll try and be resilient and save time for the distinguished speaker that will come after me. I'm Alessandro Lazzari. I have a past experience of nine plus years in the European Commission Joint Research Center. So we were providing like support to DG Home in the European program for critical infrastructure protection. So I would say that my background is more in critical infrastructure pro protection, but I moved recently in crisis uh, management incident response and, and public warning. And I think they are extremely fascinating fields in which we still need a lot of work to be done. Uh, I will, you know, quickly recall some of the messages that already Philippe and, uh, you know, Zoltan have sent before. I fully agree that um, public warning system is just an enabler. It will be, it will pave the way toward having a resilient society, the way we use also to call it the days I was uh, still at the commission, where um, we change a little bit the way that citizens behave in case of crisis. Uh, if they are able, if, the, if they are correctly instructed, they should help themselves because uh, we cannot help everyone uh, the more when the crisis is overwhelming. Therefore, I think that uh, the public warning system are really a very good tool. Uh, at the same time, that's why I agree with the messages that have been already shared with us before, is uh, we need to work a lot more in improving the awareness of the countries so they can, through the public warning system, send uh, very focused and very you know, practical messages to the citizen uh, they shouldn't be spending time in interpreting the instruction, but really do what is in the instruction that is broadcasted, notified to them. But at the same time, we need to improve the, the, the citizen preparedness. So I fully agree with the, you know, the calls that have been described briefly by Philippe before, because the citizen have proven not to be so proactive in using, you know, this system or in abiding with the system, there is cases. I mean, I'm sharing the, you know, the, 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 uh, my slot with the Queen de Boot from the crisis centrum of Belgium. They, you know, we'll sh we share some of, of the insight of them dealing with the flooding in mid-July. But there is countries that have already adopted the public warning system and they don't use it properly or they use system that require citizen registration. And this is not really a successful, um, you know, way to deal with this because, uh, you know, citizen very often they do not bother, you know, downloading, you know, the app or registering with the app. Uh, so, I mean, uh, the configuration in which uh, you, you can broadcast and reach everyone are the one that are really welcome and are the true enabler in sending destruction to the citizen. So very quickly, what is a public warning system is, uh, a, a, you know, a system that provides an effective way to warn the public about emergencies in a timely manner. So it is very important the destruction for the public arrive in a timely manner so they can actually help themselves. Uh, it has, you know, an infrastructure. I will tell you a little bit about. It's very open. It's very flexible. It uh, it can integrate the farther stream, because uh, it enables instantaneous and continuous broadcasting. When you start a campaign of, uh, you know, an alerting campaign, you can go back on the sa same campaign, send updates, so keep the citizen posted about the same exact event and keep a channel of communication with them. This is, I think, very important. 
but uh, last but not least, maximizing the chance of, the chance of reaching them. Today we are, you know, uh, you know, surrounded by a lot of the technologies, but this one heavily relies on the broadcast that comes on your smartphone. There is plenty of other systems like sirens, you know, apps and so on and so forth, the radio and the TV. But on this, I will share a quote of um, a colleague of mine that is, uh, you know, a security officer from, uh, you know, an underground in uh, in one of the capital of the, our wonderful member states. They told me we have the speakerphone in the underground. We can announce that the people ask to leave the station. They won't do it because he said, uh, you know, this TikTok generation, these youngsters, they go with the earphone. They won't listen. So I need this message to appear on their screen. So the more, you know, channel I have to reach them, the more it, I, I will maximize the chance, you know, to actually send them an instruction. And as you can see from the description below the definition that I adopted, that these systems are very simple to, to be used because they need to be used in crisis time, so they need to be very straightforward, and they are very, very, um, they, their application is very wide. You know, you can start, you, you can use them, you know, up to the, you know, crisis like the flooding, but also for general interest kind of, uh, uh, broadcasting like stay hydrated or stay away from that lack of uh, of the of the island. So they are very powerful. Uh, what we need really to work on is, uh, of course, to improve you know the you know the country's uh, ability in having you know a total awareness. Therefore, to provide you know very useful and very you know effective instruction, and then also the response by the citizen. You know, with the COVID application, we have seen, you know, that very often the citizen haven't even downloaded it and it wasn't really working. So uh, this system is very resilient because it relies on multiple channels that can actually reach the citizen and provide the proof that the, the citizen have been reached. A few words about the characteristic of a public calling system, I will leave, uh, you know, like a, a better a better description of their usage, you know, to the uh, Tukun that we talk immediately after me. They need to be scalable. In our experience, they have, they can they should handle they should handle multiple accounts with multiple privilege all over the geography of a country. So you can give it from the central authority up to the local authority. So it can be used like in a during a sport event just to notify people that is in a stadium because you can just select the area that you want to notify. So they can handle very narrow places up to the country level. And uh, this is very successful because if you manage to, you know, to fragment the usage, you know, every authority can also, you know, send, um, send, um, you know, warning and uh, flexible. As I said already, uh, it has to be capable of triggering multiple channel, location based, self broadcast app, sirens is in, oh, very often also integrated with sirens in the countries that did adopt them, and social media. Social media are very important. We have, we have already, you know, integrated, you know, Facebook and Twitter, and uh, it's very powerful because, you know, you post with your with the account of the authority on Facebook and Twitter, you absolutely enhance the possibility to reach the people, and then modular. Therefore, it is very open architecture that is also open to new streams. So, if new streams will come. Uh, it, it should be absolutely able to add them, you know, to the current. You know, average configuration. Talking about configuration at the moment, what we see is that uh, the, the system is mainly, com mainly composed of the average system is mainly composed of, of cell broadcasting entity and cell broadcasting center. These imply, you know, a strong cooperation with mobile network operator because they are the one that then really through their architecture, you know, the messages are broadcasted. Uh, this architecture, the way it is built. Uh, in our case, we are cooperating with Telenet in Belgium, but uh, it has proven to be very robust. Uh, the only the only message that I would like to send from this slide is that it has proven to be very robust. Therefore, able to handle an enormous amount of broadcasts and you know the capability to reach you know uh, the population. And uh, good news is that uh, all along all the programs that have been launched by the Commission in order to, you know, to improve disaster risk uh, reduction. And uh, I mean, there is also the European Electronic Communication Code that is uh, as a set, you know, a deadline for the member states to have a public calling system that can send geotargeted emergency alerts in place by June 2022. So on these, uh, I think the Commission has already done an, uh, an outstanding work of alignment among the member states. So they all rely on the same tools. 
as I said before leaving the floor to to, to you know Mr. Uh, Mr. Good is uh, we still need to work on the you know the public um, perception of these messages and on uh, you know of, of course on the and this cannot happen if the member states uh, you uh, don't use the system. So we need to work on the member state to use the system because there is member states that are heavily using we have a use case here and some member states that have it, the technology in place but they are not really relying on it. Uh, I think it will be part of the, you know, the way we will change the, the way we will handle certain crises where we will seek for the involvement of the citizen a lot more so that they can help themselves. And for the time being, of course, open to question. Uh, thanks for your attention. I will now, with the permission of Philippe, hand the floor to Mr. De Boot for you know, the continuation of this slot. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Alessandro, for your very interesting presentation. And of course, yeah, pass, pass the floor to, to, to Kun. Thank you. You are unmuted. Yes. Uh, so I hope you can all hear me now. Yes, we, we, uh, we can hear you. I'm just going to check if I share my screen. Okay, so I'll just take uh, several minutes to to talk you through uh, what we experienced in Belgium uh, with the floodings in July 21. Um, my name is Kunde Butt. Um, I've been working for the federal national uh, the National Belgian Crisis Center for for uh, 15 years now. Um, of which uh, six years uh, I am responsible for uh, the Belgium uh, public warning system, Be Alert, um, a system which was heavily used uh, during the, the Belgium floodings. Just to set the scene, um, half of July, uh, we faced uh, floodings in our country um and which caused uh, a scale of devastation we hadn't seen uh, before in our country um and unfortunately uh, i think we must prepare uh, for the fact that uh, this uh, will not be the last time um this means that uh, our public warning system um we think it's it's uh, really a very relevant tool um and it has to be future proof um, as the use of it will only uh, grow, uh, we think. Um, the scheme you see, um, I'm, I'm just going to talk um, about uh, what is Be Alert very briefly, um, and then I'll take uh, some minutes uh, time just to highlight uh, how it was used uh, during the floodings. But so, um, as you see, uh, Be Alert uh, is the central uh, public warning platform uh, in Belgium, um, a platform which can be activated uh, on three levels, uh, can be activated by the mayor, the governor, and uh, the minister of the interior. Um, in practice, we see that uh, most of the cases, 95% uh, of all uh, public warnings, um, they are sent uh, on a local scale um, and uh, Be Alert is activated mainly by uh, mayors. Be Alert is a, is a website, uh, a web platform, um, and once a minister, governor or mayor decides to uh, send out a public warning, uh, they can do, see, do so by uh, making use of Be Alert and uh, choosing the right channel or a combination of uh, channels uh, to reach uh, the public uh, concerned. Uh, we have three main uh, possibilities. First of all, it is possible to send out messages um, on the basis of, uh, uh, of uh, subscriptions. So we have uh, 900 uh, 20,000 uh, citizens, Belgian citizens, who subscribe to Be Alert. Um, we are told uh, that we must see this uh, as uh, quite a, a success, uh, but uh, we're well aware of the fact that only with this uh, subscription part 
we cannot uh, alert the public um, in total. Um, when we send out messages uh, based on subscriptions, we have the possibility to send out SMS, but also uh, vo voice calls, uh, emails. Uh, the, the email channel, for example, was used heavily uh, during the uh, corona pandemic. A second uh, uh, big uh, feature uh, in Be Alert um, is complementary to uh, the, the public warnings based on subscriptions. Um, it's the uh, location based SMS, uh, which, uh, which means that uh, based on uh, a position um, of citizens, uh, whether they are linked uh, to uh, Cell, cell phone um, and, and cell phone uh, infrastructure, um, we can reach them. Uh, so this means that we can uh, 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 drive up the numbers uh, of success uh, until we reach, uh, we think about uh, 90 or 95 percent of all citizens uh, impacted uh, by a certain uh, certain crisis. And then a third uh, integration we have in our platform uh, are uh, the integrations uh, based on the uh, common alerting uh, protocol. Um, and uh, this offers a sort of uh, a door uh, towards um, all sorts of, uh, of channels used by uh, third parties, such as uh, electronic billboards, but uh, it can be uh, GPS in cars as well. Um, it can be uh, websites uh, or even smart TV, why not? Um, uh, so that's a, a third uh, integration um, and this uh, furthers our uh, possibilities. Uh, we've only uh, started uh, with this integration uh, this year. So what we've seen during the floodings is that uh, be alert has been uh, heavily used uh, some well, a bit more than uh, 100 campaigns public warning campaigns have been sent out of which uh, 60 of them uh, on one day uh, july the 15th alone um, as you see most of these campaigns uh, have been sent out uh, on a local level um, we've seen uh, 58 warning campaigns, really warning campaigns, preventive, uh, on the territory uh, of uh, uh, 37 uh, municipalities. Um, after that, we've seen uh, some uh, 40 information campaigns or follow-up campaigns um, in 25 of these municipalities. And uh, what is important as well, uh, due to the, the large uh, scale, we have also, also seen um, two uh, warning campaigns on the uh, complete territory of two provinces. Um, this gave us a total um, of 2,000 emails, 13,000 uh, voice calls, um, 160,000 subscription-based SMS and 2 million location-based SMS. This is important to us um, because as you see uh, 13,000 uh, voice calls, um, with a voice call you have other possibilities than with a simple SMS. Um, voice call can for example be used uh, for waking up uh, people. Um, so uh, it's it's mainly the strength of the of the platform in our strategy uh, certainly is the combination of all of these uh, channels uh, together. Um, just to give you an idea of the contents of the, the message, it was not only uh, about evacuation and sheltering, uh, so the, the messages were not only preventive, um, but as uh, Alessandro uh, also uh, pointed out, uh, creating um, a, a lifeline to your citizens and following up uh, with the, the correct information uh, is really key uh, to our uh, strategy of communication. 
uh, and uh, I think each uh, example of crisis communication. Um, I'm not here to tell you that uh, thanks to the alert uh, we could uh, we could do uh, all well and all went well um, in our uh, crisis management and in uh, our public warning. Uh, not at all, uh, but we know that uh, thanks to Be Alert, um, we had uh, an added value. Things could have been uh, much, much worse um, if only we would have had uh, this crisis uh, six years ago, uh, then um, things would have been uh, far worse. Um, the challenges uh, we still face uh, in this public warning strategy on an organizational uh, level, uh, level uh, we're looking at uh, faster decision making. Uh, faster decision making uh, can make for a faster warning. Uh, warning. Uh, so it's always uh, the question: uh, which level is best placed uh, to send out uh, the public warnings? Um, and there we have to trade off um, the the speed of sending and the relevance of uh, the message of the content. Uh, so there is uh, something to be said uh, for uh, a public warning on each level. Uh, on the technical side, uh, we, we still face um, some other challenges as well. Um, that's, uh, it remains a, a fast, very fast and uh, precise uh, sending of uh, messages. There, uh, with a location-based uh, SMS channel, um, we think uh, it works well, uh, but in a very, very rapid crisis, um, there, uh, I think we'll have to look for uh, other possibilities as well. And I uh, certainly welcome the initiative um, of uh, integrating uh, Galileo uh, to send out warning messages uh, as a future possibility. And uh, of course, um, the relevance of uh, follow up uh, messages I spoke uh, about. Um, the most important uh, thing in our uh, public warning strategy uh, to keep in mind, uh, we think, is that uh, this multi channel approach um, and this, this approach really remains uh, key in our Belgian uh, warning strategy. So that was just a very quick view on um, the way uh, we, we tried uh, to, to, to help during these floodings uh, with our public warning system, Be Alert. I'm very happy to take your questions uh, now or afterwards. Uh, so uh, shoot, uh, I would say. Thank you. Thank you very much to both, both of you, uh, Alessandro and and Kuhn, it has been very um, interesting as well to uh, that you guide us, well, you provide us all this background information. I would like to invite you to look at the, the chat uh, um, where well, you have uh, several uh, remarks, several questions. So so please, uh, please uh, interact with the, uh, the audience uh, via the chat. And if, well, there are some issues that are not yes, yet uh, discussed and solved, I would invite you to come back in uh, the uh, discussions at the end of the workshop. But thank you very much. It has been very useful, very, very instructive, very uh, well. It's a good, good learning, uh, learning presentation. Thank you very much. And I will uh, like to move to to the next uh, presentation. Uh, I was not surprised to to hear uh, in the chat that Alex uh, Romagna, uh, who is a CEO of uh, of Predict. Uh, is very busy in, in in France because I saw the information yesterday. Maybe you have heard that in the the region of Gare, you know, close to Nîmes and so on, there are a lot of uh, very big flooding events that occurred yesterday due to to heavy heavy rainfall. And since Alex is uh, chairing uh, this uh, predict uh, SME, is is really uh, very busy uh, today. But uh, we are. Uh, I'm very very happy that Guillaume. Uh, Guillaume Lahash uh, could could take uh, take over, and I would like to to invite him to to give to give you few insight into what what Predict is is doing. So uh, service oriented uh, views. So Guillaume, if you are here, yes. Hi, okay, everybody. so 
Thank you very much for, for joining us. No problem. So I'll share you my screen. It's okay. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, it's okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, the floor Perfect. is yours. So uh, today I will present you uh, the concept of uh, product services, uh, an expert of risk management. Uh, also applied uh, with the recent event uh, in uh, early uh, July. So product services is a specialist in uh, hydrometeorological risk management. Um, the company was created in 2006 uh, with Meteo France, Airbus and BRL. Uh, the aim is to combine uh, hydrometeorology, telecommunication, space imagery and uh, expertise in uh, risk management. The service uh, is available on uh, worldwide. And act nowadays, uh, our product service uh, works with more than uh, 30,000 French territories and French oversized territories. Uh, several industrial uh, sites assisted in uh, 90 countries and uh, in different uh, countries like uh, Argentina, Brazil, Morocco, for example. Nowadays, uh, 35 engineers, specialists in risk management, are, are on call. The concept of uh, product services um, is based on the three, four uh, steps. The first step is the uh, Knoe territories. Um, the aim uh, of this phase is to uh, analyze the vulnerability uh, of the territory, uh, like uh, the exposed uh, stakes, uh, like uh, school, hospital, etc. The second step is to transmit the right information at the appropriate uh, time to have uh, an, adapt an adapted uh, comportment with a different uh, communication network, like SMS, mail, uh, notification. Uh, the, the, the next step is to take the information into account uh, to take the right and suitable decision for the users. Um, the different users are citizens, communities, industrial uh, sites. And finally, to apply the security instruction and uh, implement action plan. To make this efficient uh, concept, uh, product services uh, use the different data uh, like uh, rainfall estimation, the radar imagery, uh, lightning impacts uh, worldwide, the different running, etc. This uh, concept uh, has uh, developed on, uh, during the event uh, of July uh, 14, uh, 17 in France. Uh, during this period, uh, several information was transmitted uh, to different users, uh, taking account uh, the level of severity um, of the event. Uh, as you can see in this uh, slide, um, you can see the different uh, um, level uh, safeguard level on the 16 uh, July. Uh, for information during this event, uh, project services uh, inform uh, 100 uh, and uh, 16, 6, 6, 16, 6, sorry territories uh, in uh, take safety action. Uh, 4,106 territories have reached the be prepared level, and more than uh, 15,000 uh, territories have reached the be vigilant level. Uh, on this slide, you can see an example of the web platform and the tools uh, used by Predict Services. Uh, you can see several uh, pictograms uh, which present uh, the, the different. Uh, uh, swollen rivers uh, on the, the northwestern part uh, of France. On each uh, pictogram, you can see different information on the risk ongoing uh, along the, the river and the comportment uh, was adopted uh, by the, the users. Um, also, the, the, the spatial imagery uh, plays a, an important role uh, during this, uh, this phases. Uh, before, during, and after an event. Uh, before, uh, because um, it's possible uh, now to, to, to elaborate a foot plan area uh, thanks to DTM, for example, produced by space. Um, during, with different data like uh, estimate uh, precipitation in real time 
and after to use uh, the, the imagery space like uh, Sentinel to uh, to analyze uh, the, the past events and the damage. So um, to respond uh, on this uh, issues, uh, predicts uh, leads uh, uh, a big project with ESA and the CNES. Uh, the name of this project is uh, COSPARIN, Spatial Contribution to Food Risk Analysis. Uh, the aim of this project uh, is to have uh, to elaborate two main data. Uh, the first is the global rainfall estimation by uh, Meteor France, uh, and the second uh, data is uh, the food prone area by CEREMA. And um, during the, the, this project, the aim is to improve uh, the, the efficient food risk management uh, worldwide with uh, this uh, with this data. For the first data, the flood prone area, uh, the aim is to, to include on the execo model, which use uh, only the topography, uh, a DTM uh, like uh, WorldM. Um, so the more accurate the DTM is, the better the put will be. So it's interesting uh, on this project to use uh, the, the DTM of uh, Airbus because uh, the resolution is very accurate. So we obtain a large uh, areas uh, with a potential flood prone area. The second data is the global uh, one fall estimation. So the aim of this, uh, of this process is to elaborate a, a world mosaic of infrared satellites every 30 minutes with geostationary satellite and uh, polar orbiting satellites. Uh, with this data, we include uh, into a neural approach and a training file. Um, uh, this data to to to, to obtain uh, a global food, uh, a global rainfall estimation every 30 minutes worldwide, uh, with a resolution of five kilometers. This data allows to 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 to, uh, to take a decision uh, in real time, um, even if uh, we have uh, no uh, radar imagery, like in African continent, uh, for example. Concerning the post-event uh, damage assessment, uh, the objective is to have a, a quick assessment of the damage after an event. Um, and uh, there are four, um, four more objectives. Uh, the first is the estimation of impact uh, areas. Uh, the second is the evaluation of the impact stakes uh, to, to optimize uh, the, the user support, like uh, insurance company, uh, uh, safety authorities, etc. Uh, there is an example uh, during the event uh, early July uh, in Germany uh, and the, along the R Valley. You can see the, the satellite, um, the Sentinel-2 uh, images on uh, uh, 20, 21 July, six uh, days after the flood. You can see the, the mud along uh, along the, the river to determine to determine the, the 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 max of the the, the flood. The same uh, on the Bad Noyer, uh, six days of the, after the flood, you can see the mud uh, on the street. Another example uh, in France, uh, on the uh, beginning of October in 2020, uh, Alpes Maritime, um, in Saint Martin de Vesubi, uh, after uh, extreme uh, flash floods uh, in October. So you can see uh, an example of uh, images uh, seven days after the event. You can see uh, accuracy the, the different landslide and the, the damage to the to the woods and to the buildings was a uh, collapse. So to conclude, uh, thanks to the, this new innovative data from space, essentially by space. Uh, there are new perspectives uh, to open up to better anticipate uh, hydrometeorological uh, risk, such as floods, but also to better understand the, the, the evolution of climate change uh, and improve resilience. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Guillaume, for your interesting presentation. Well, there are some. Uh, some questions in, in the chat. I would invite you to to reply directly to to, to the to the audience uh, via the chat. 
uh, thank you. Well, this is very, very practical exa uh, examples that are very, very useful, uh, I guess, to, to the audience. They will come back to you via the chat and uh, possibly via questions in uh, the last uh, in the last uh, stop. I would like to add to to make some well to progress. But we are a little bit late in in time, and I would uh, like to invite now uh, uh, the uh, Veronique Sule uh, Revel and Frédéric Martina. I don't know how you want to to make the presentation. If both of you will speak, well, just uh, the floor is yours. I give you uh, full freedom in, in sharing. Okay. Your presentation. Great. So can can you see the slides? Uh? We can see perfectly the slides. Yes, thank you. Okay, great. So thank you, uh, Philippe. So indeed, my name is uh, Frédéric Martinon, and I'm a co-founder of uh, EarthLive, that is an internal startup project from Thales Group and Thales Alenia Space. So I'm here in the call with uh, Véronique Soule Revel, who is the other co-founder of the venture, and she will. Uh, also answer to the question at the end. And in this venture, we are exploring a new paradigm in the Earth observation that can really make a difference in uh, disaster risk uh, reduction. So when uh, we think about uh, Earth observation, it has al always been uh, used by civil protection for disaster risk reduction. But when we think of existing solutions based on low Earth orbit constellations, they are all facing different problems. So the first problem is the long revisit period. It takes uh, several hours or even several days for a low Earth orbit satellite to come back to the same area of uh, interest. And the second problem is the cloud coverage, because maybe, and especially in times of uh, heavy rainfalls, there might be cloud coverage. So when the satellite uh, is there, uh, there is no clear image. So you need to wait again the revisit period, maybe several hours, several days, to get a new image that is also maybe uh, another cloud uh, image. Third problem, uh, this kind of low Earth orbit satellite, they need to wait to be inside of a ground station to downlink the data. So again, there is no a real time data. And finally, this kind of existing solution have a limited uh, SWOT. So each acquisition can cover only a small area, a few square kilometers, so typically four kilometers uh, by uh, six kilometers. So it's a kind of narrow. So today we will talk about a complete uh, paradigm shift in Earth observation. And the concept is to have a permanent observation of the Earth from geostationary orbit instead of low Earth orbit. And the first benefit of this uh, geostationary orbit is to enable an immediate allocation of the sensor. So we can take acquisition of images and even quasi video in a real time. The second benefit of uh, this uh, geostationary orbit is to be able to download immediately and in real time the acquisition to a ground station. And if uh, the area of interest is under cloud coverage, the system can wait few minutes or few hours if needed until there is a bright spot, there is a, uh, the clouds disappear, and then the system can take the first cloud-free snapshot as soon as uh, there is a cloud-free uh, period. Finally, uh, based on this flow of uh, quasi-video acquisition, it will be possible to automatically detect objects and phenomena using uh, artificial intelligence algorithm. And for instance, I can take the example of the detection of uh, the ignition of a new forest fire, for instance, within 10 minutes, or the ability to track the evolution of all fire fronts on a very large area and in real time. So the ultimate benefits for civil protection will be uh, early detection and early warning for disaster and a better situational awareness in the answer to, uh, to disaster. So. How does it work? So the first uh, possible implementation of this concept is to embark a telescope and to host it as an hosted payload on a telecommunication satellite in a geostationary orbit. So based on this uh, telescope, we will be able to take uh, spots of 200 kilometers by 200 kilometers. 
so within uh, the coverage of the satellite so here this is the, the, the square here from a latitude of minus 55 to a latitude of plus 55 so within this coverage we can in few seconds point the telescope to a spot of 200 by 200 and we can in few seconds uh, change the orientation to and scan a larger area in terms of uh, bands uh, it could be first uh, rgb and uh, near infrared and the ground resolution that is expected could be uh, 40 meters uh, at nadir the download of uh, all the acquisition to the ground station is expected to occur at a throughput of one gigabit per second. And based on the artificial intelligence processing that uh, I will describe uh, later, and if we are talking about a moving object, vessel, for instance, in, in the sea, uh, we would be able to detect uh, sub pixel objects. Talk about half pixel detection. So, for instance, for a vessel, it could be possible to detect a 20 meter uh, vessel. In terms of a night acquisition, it could be possible either because the observed phenomenon uh, emits light. Uh, so, for instance, a fire uh, usually emits uh, lights. So, it could be possible to have a night acquisition. Or for objects who don't emit light by themselves, we could use the illumination from the moon to be able to detect them during the night. And in terms of the capacity uh, sharing, because uh, there is a single telescope that uh, must be shared between the different usages. So three modes of, of operations are uh, envisaged. So first mode with the lowest priority would be a, a routine mode. So for instance, take the whole Mediterranean, Mediterranean Sea a uh, few, few times a day. The on-demand mode when there is a specific phenomenon to observe. So, for instance, uh, when there is a high risk of fire, we can activate uh, specific surveillance of uh, zones that are um, subject to, to forest fire risk. Or a high priority mode, that is a full preemption of the capacity of the telescope to follow up very closely and in real time uh, a single zone to track, for instance, uh, a go-fast that uh, would be in, in the Mediterranean Sea uh, delivering the drug. So now if we focus more on the ground processing, uh, so if we take again the example of the forest fire with early detection and tracking of the evolution of fair fronts, so first it starts by an activation of the system when uh, there is a high risk of fire. Then the system would uh, scan uh, by zones of 200 kilometers by 200 kilometers. So here is the representation for the source of France. So we can scan large areas, download all the data in real time to a ground station. And then on the ground station, we could have an artificial intelligence algorithm to automatically detect the ignition of new forest fire. And also for existing forest fire, use artificial intelligence algorithm to extract the, the contours, the position, and the speed vectors of all fire fronts in parallel on a large zone. Then the system would uh, create a cat catalog and index all the relevant data, and uh, it would be possible to integrate these relevant data to existing tools for a disaster risk reduction. So for instance, uh, tools like uh, common operation feature so we could really uh, integrate the relevant data in existing tool by CLC. And finally, we can also think about uh, exploiting the, um, the deepness of uh, historical data for more advanced product as we call the patterns of life. And to stay in the use case of the, the forest fire, for instance, it could be used to validate the propagation models of uh, fire fronts based on the real propagation of real fire to improve the, the models. So to uh, extend a bit uh, to other use cases, so all these use cases have been actively discussed with uh, many organizations. So it could be a private company, it could be a, a European organizations like uh, GRC or ECMWF. So all these use cases are being discussed with uh, all these organizations. So forest fire, I already described them. 
another interesting use case is the ability to track uh, specific cloud formations that we call uh, overshooting tops that are important because, because they are precursor of uh, heavy rainfalls and even uh, flash floods. So then uh, it would be possible to alert uh, the public warning system that we have seen, we have seen before, uh, be um, fed by this early warning system and alerts of overshooting tops. Another uh, use case that was mentioned is uh, when there is a disaster of any nature, uh, you want to have a view of what's happening. So Zoltan in the first presentation said that uh, during a disaster situation can change from one hour to the other. And then this ability uh, to take immediate acquisition and especially the first cloud free acquisition, if uh, the disaster involves the cloud, uh, we need to wait a bit, but not all disasters uh, involve clouds. And if there is uh, cloud coverage, we can wait the first bright spot to take the first cloud free picture and then enhance the rapid mapping um, and uh, first uh, evaluation product with this kind of immediate first cut free picture. And finally, based on this first cut free uh, picture, we can also think about the assessment of uh, impact of the disaster, for instance, a flood impact to have uh, through algorithm, uh, an evaluation of the number of houses or the number of people that could have been affected by the disaster since the flood. So finally, um, my last message is that uh, we are we have pre-identified uh, several calls in uh, Eurozone, Eurozone Europe in 2021. So for instance, the DRS 0102 and the DRS 0103. And uh, we believe that this capacity could be a good uh, add-on to uh, the, the project. So, uh, if uh, you are uh, leading or joining a consortium to answer this course, we are more than happy to, uh, to uh, talk with you and uh, to explore how we could bring this permanent monitoring capacity from a geostationary orbit to the discussion and to the project. So thanks a lot. So you have here our contact details, uh, our website, orsaf.space and our email addresses uh, via the email available and contact details. Thanks for your attention. It's a question now, I guess. Thank you very much, Frédéric, and, and Veroni for taking up to space a little. So it's it's uh, it's quite a very, very interesting. Well, I would like to open the, the floor for, for, for possible uh, questions but, but by the audience, or maybe we, we can wait until uh, until the last uh, the last sessions because I have uh, okay. I have foreseen to have an open discussion. We we still have one uh, one presentation to go with Daniel, so I would I would propose that we leave the open questions to to the end and then we take the, our time to uh, to to have a chat there. Uh, you will maybe have some questions on the chat. Just just look look at them and then we come back to you uh, after Daniel's presentation. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much, very much. Daniel, are you here? Yes. Hello. <laughs> hello. I, I, I will try to share my window. Let me see. Don't only Please. try, don't only try. <clears throat> A screen, I'm not Perfect. sure what, what is seen. We see something. Yeah, well, you, you you see the full screen. Sorry, uh, I will do this uh, in the full screen. But then I need first to share the full screen. Uh, screen here, share, and then I need to go to the presentation. Apparently now it's yes. working. Yes, it's Perfect. working. So, uh, hello everybody. Uh, we are here uh, in this very interesting session. And when I, 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 I was invited by Philippe, I was thinking about what to say. You know, all of you, we know all of us uh, that uh, the Germany floods is a sensitive uh, 
event, very recent, with a huge number of fatalities. So we all know we need to be very cautious about what we can say and uh, our um, reactions. But I thought also that from a scientific perspective, we need to put on the table that uh, even in, the, in these uh, catastrophic events, we have the possibility to learn, learn from the positive aspects, learn from the negative aspects, and this is the only way to progress, to learn about what has happened. And this is what I try, will try to summarize uh, through this, uh, this uh, presentation. Um, you know, you have seen uh, this kind of, of, of media news that are uh, pointing that uh, something was not good. And I should say that for me, if uh, a big number of uh, fatalities occur, is that something was not, not uh, probably working perfectly or, or good enough. And this is, I think, one of the, of the points that we can comment. Let me, let me start by uh, showing you uh, some capaci capacities we have and that are in the positive aspects of what happened. This is the accumulation rainfall for 24 hours for the 14th July, um, seen by the European network of radars. And this is, this is really amazing. Uh, even with uh, all our difficulties to share data and to work together, uh, we have a network of radars operating uh, all together and sharing the information. And this composite at European scale is useful and used every day. And this is seen through the IFA system. I will, I will talk uh, about this European flood awareness system that is run by uh, under the Copernicus Emergency Management System. That means that this was operational, of course, the 24 uh, hours accumulation just after the accumulated uh, uh, time, but it was also available hour by hour, the accumulations and, and the instant uh, images, not just for a given country, but for the full uh, European uh, country. So that means that when something happened like this, that it is cross-border, you, uh, you, you have tools or we have tools all together to see these kind of things happening and coming the rain from one country to another country. And this, I, I, I think that we need to recognize this is very important um, achievement uh, that have been done by HumanNet, the uh, European Association of uh, National Meteorological Services that are cooperating to, to have these kind of tools. So we can see that the event was uh, cross-border. We was uh, with an extension very important and with in high intensities that in this region are not normal over a very huge or big surface, let me say. So um, we have um, um, quantities of more than 100 millimeters uh, in 24 hours over a big surface. So the effect is cumulative because the topography will concentrate on this water. So this is relevant to see that it is uh, this uh, huge uh, surface effect. What is IFAS? IFAS, this European Flood Awareness System, is operational under Copernicus and provide two kinds of, of uh, forecasts. The first uh, family is from 72 hours in advance to six hours and is based on the national and on the numerical weather prediction models, the meteorological. Again, this is a success story because we have probably one of the most advanced um, meteorological models families in, in the world. And this is again because we have an, an, uh, an European center of uh, medium weather range uh, forecast. That means that all the European countries are collaborating together to get this on the uh, cutting edge of the technology and the capacities to forecast uh, meteorological events. And this is the, the, the source uh, that use IFAS to provide a number of products. And what is amazing also is that IFAS has been possible because of the developments of several uh, European projects. IFAS was born from EFS, European Flood Forecasting System that was an 
European project that finalized in 2003. And uh, at that moment, after the uh, inundations also in Germany in the previous year, it was uh, decided that this system developed under a, new, a, a European project, a scientific project, uh, can be uh, the precursor of our operational system. So IFAS started there, and uh, there is some products that are based on the hydrological model for uh, big rivers, but also there is a product, a family of products based on uh, these meteorological models, but for flash flood forecasting. And that was developed in the project, in the European scientific project in Prince. And in Prince finalized in 2008, and one of the outcomes was the integration of these kind of flash flood products in IFAS. This was uh, the core of the IFAS that went in operation in 2012. And uh, after five years of operation, we had a total new uh, branch of products based on this uh, European network of radars. And this is based on no casting uh, the, the data from the radars and we introduce or if us uh, editate the uh, results of uh, the erica project that it was a prevention and preparedness project from the european civil protection dg echo and this erica indicator is complementing the eric indicator in efas one is based on the radar Erica and the other on the meteorological models for flash floods, precisely for flash floods. And this has been even pushed further during the Anywhere project, another scientific project in, in, from, from the European Commission, uh, further testing the products and even uh, getting a resolution of 200 meters as a prototype in some seven uh, some uh, uh, pilot sites. But essentially, uh, what we have operational in, in, in AFAS is at one square kilometer, that it is a very nice, uh, a very nice point. This was operational because it's operational. This is what uh, has been seen uh, on 13 July at noon UTC, universal time. And uh, that means that uh, one day before, essentially, we had uh, this uh, map of the Eric indicator for flash floods. Uh, essentially saying that there was a huge probability of having flash floods on a big area around the, uh, the, with the Rhine or between the Germany and, and, and Belgium. And if we go to the place of the Hard River, one of the most affected one that you have seen for sure in the, in the pictures, uh, what uh, the system IFAS yeah, was providing 31 hours in advance it was this announcement that it is uh, here we have the probability distribution based on the meteorological model of, of what? Of the indicator for flash flood in a given basin. And for this basin, that it is a medium-sized basin, let me say, the R River, we got this time a, a clear signal that something very important will happen in terms of flash flooding and uh, with uh, and the warning codes, let me say, is associated to the number, the percentile of the members in the forecast that uh, exceed a certain threshold. And uh, we have also the return period of the different members showing that uh, the, we, we were in front of something uh, quite, uh, quite important to come. Then this is what has been observed uh, through the OPERA data that accumulation, uh, our accumulations along the, uh, the day, 14 uh, July, the, the, we will see the loop again. And you have here one of the products uh, of the impact products that we that are available through IFAS, that it is the Erika indicator for flash flood. And uh, uh, what you have is that the information uh, the meteorological information of the forecast is translated into impact information uh, for a, a related hazard that in case uh, is uh, flash floods. You have three levels of impact, and you can see that uh, there is clearly a signal on the third level on the red uh, pixels uh, 
that it is recognized uh, by this uh, by this system and by these indicators and in the correct place and in the correct time so this was of course available through ifas and uh, it's also available through other other uh, ways but uh, through ifas in particular and what is uh, nice to understand what, uh, what happened essentially is to see this map this is the maximum uh, level reached during the, these 24 hours and you have uh, the accumulation of the water for 22, uh, from the 24 hours and the maximum uh, level of impact uh, for the indicator. What does mean? This means that the meteorological information, essentially the rain that it is coming or that it has been uh, recorded, is translated in impact at one square kilometers over the entire uh, European Union. And this is operational and this is available. One thing is that is operational and available through Copernicus Emergency Management System, and the other is that can be used by uh, the companies or the, or the authorities, what is probably not the case at the moment. But these are there. There are uh, positive aspects of this event because we know that the skills we have to anticipate in several hours, these kind of things are there, are capacities we have at our hands. And of course, it is complex to move from these capacities to a real response on the terrain and a local level in a case like this one. Let me, let me see more, more details. This was the, um, the system, uh, the results of the system uh, five hours before the maximum in this R river. This was issued at the uh, uh, on the 14th July at uh, 16 uh, Central Time, uh, in Central European uh, Time. Uh, that means uh, 2 p.m. at the UTC, five hours before the, the maximum of, of the uh, flood uh, impact, let me say, in, in the R river. What does it mean? Does mean that this, that it is available through IFAS, is a way, an effective way to translate what means uh, heavy rain. A heavy rain like this will mean that this river and not the other one yeah, on this portion, on these pixels, will be affected by a level three impact flash flood. So that's, that's the information we can have now at hand. Of course, this, the capacity of doing this forecast and even translate this in, into these uh, indicators is not enough. And I wanted to, uh, to mention this uh, comment uh, made by the International Federation of Red Cross years ago, that the early warning system are only as good as the actions they catalyze. If we are not able to catalyze actions, if we are not able to, to contribute to make the correct actions in the correct time, our capacities are not well developed. We, we, are, we are not with a system that is able really to do warnings because the warning system includes the catalyz catalyzation of these actions. So we need to trigger these actions. Which is the concept? The concept is that meteorological forecast, that it is what majority is the information that we have at hand, even authorities and population, is not enough. We need to translate this meteorological forecast into impact forecast. That means that the forecast or the announcement is not what, which will be the weather, but which will be the consequences, which will be the effects in a given place in a given time. But even when we reach this point, we need to transform these into actionable decisions and support with operational services these actionable decisions. If not, we fail because the information itself doesn't help the reaction. So we need to advance all this technology we have seen also already here into systems impact-based that are able to trigger actionable decisions at local level. If not, we cannot uh, um, claim that we are prepared for what is coming. And what is coming? Well, 
what is coming is that climate change is augmenting the frequencies of extreme events. And we need to be prepared for unusual events and ubiquitous events because they will happen everywhere, not, not just in the places in which they are used. So recording one month rainfall in few hours will be the new normality, probably across all Europe. And this is something that, for instance, in the Mediterranean regions, this is not, this is not a, an amazing thing because we are used to have half year rainfall in 24 hours. But now the, 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 the new normality is that this kind of events will happen in places that are not used up to now, to cities. So in Germany, Belgium, 14 July, we have up to, let me say, 200 millimeters in 24 hours, between 100 and 200, with more than 40 millimeters in one hour in the place in which the, uh, the intensities were more uh, heavy. That means essentially two months rainfall in 24 hours. But in this event, a few days ago in, in Spain, we had 220 millimeters in three hours. From these 220, 77 in 30 minutes, not in an hour, 30 minutes. That means six months rainfall in 24 hours. And this is what is coming. This will be more usual. And in fact, this is recorded every now and then. And we have on on the on just in the last months, we have an event like in Aven and Angen. Uh, 8 September uh, in France, 130 millimeters in three hours, uh, two months rainfall in three hours, or in Sardagnola in, in Catalonia, in Spain, 300 millimeters in 24 hours, over 100 millimeters in one hour, six months rainfall in 24 hours. And this will start happening in place not used to it, where the people are used to floods that happen in days, not in few hours. And the uh, new normality will be that. The, the, the floods in three hour, in few hours will will also start. So the question we need to face in the next years will be how to engage people living in risk areas, how to make them aware about the risk and aware about the changing of the risks because of climate change, and how to make them react when floods happen in few hours or even in few quarters. And for this, we need to invest in science, linking the capacities we already have, because we already have a, a bunch of capacities that are amazing, as we have seen in this, in this event, with the communities at risk to cope with these challenges. And this link is very difficult. In, we are not prepared. We are not prepared at the moment, and we are not prepared for facing what is coming as a result of the climate change. So the question is how to do, how to manage to transfer this engagement, awareness, capacity of react to the people living in places at risk when they do not uh, think that they are at risk because they are used to a past that is no more the new normality. Just to finish, uh, this is uh, the capture of uh, the 24 hours of yesterday and the event that uh, mentioned uh, Philippe in the south of France. And uh, this is uh, a proof that we have these skills, these capacities available to all authorities through the IFAS and Copernicus Emergency Management System. And what we need transfer this to uh, tools to make these actionable decisions and engagement and awareness of all our population. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you. This is really uh, going to the point of uh, the discussions. Uh, I see that you have a, a, questions, a question in the, in the chat. Uh, yes, uh, the local solutions to uh, local authorities. Well, this is certainly one of the most critical uh, issues that we are facing. Uh, main solutions that are well known by uh, local people. We are here in the discussions about uh, the failure in governance at European level because you're able 
to provide uh, information about this kind of uh, uh, utilities and type of tools and methods, then there is a very clear, uh, very clear problem regarding regarding governments uh, of risk management. So well, uh, I will I would like to to maybe uh, open the floor for discussion. Maybe we can we can open uh, the debate with this kind of question. What about uh, it? The awareness and the uh, by local authorities, by citizens about uh, what what we can do, what what uh, what do have uh, what do what we do we have access as solutions, and how to improve actually this kind of decision making chain. And I I have to say that I'm reflecting on that because we are, as you certainly know, preparing the work program for 2023-24, and I even thought that it might be useful to have to call for implementing solutions that might be, um, I would say, uh, provide uh, as a kind of rules. Uh, well, it, it's difficult to speak about rules and standards. I don't like really rigid standards regarding protocols, but at least that we have a common ground for uh, governance in Europe that should be actually falling under the UN, Union Civil Protection mechanism umbrella so it's something that i reflecting and i would like maybe to 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 reflect what you are thinking about this i'd invite also those youngs to uh, raise their hand and uh, questions to 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 the speakers I agree with Marina about the fact that uh, it's not a question of technology. Uh, I'm speaking here really about, uh, about soft, I would say, yeah. soft issues, decision making. Uh, how, yeah. Marina, yeah, please. For yes, just, thank uh, you so much to, to you, Philippe, for the invitation and for this, uh, let's say, up to the moment and uh, actual, uh, let's say, um, uh, uh, session today and thanks for the all the speakers and especially for Daniel for this last presentation of this uh, image which is just from yesterday. Um, effectively, so the sensation that I got from all this morning is that mainly the problem is not uh, is not a lot on the technology because we have seen excellent products. Uh, but on the governance at the level of uh, reform. So, uh, yes, as always, we have commented, Philippa, uh, I think that uh, from the part of research, we can we can do things, but uh, it's, it's crucial, as you commented, to involve the most operational programs here and to and to make aware to these programs the let's say the beauty and the good products that uh, that uh, the cluster three and previously secure societies in the part of disaster management and resilience is 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 obtaining because sometimes i think that in the constellation of the many options that the union is offering to civil protection to these uh, emergency responders um so so maybe they are lost no and uh, they are really products that can be ready for making the path to operational and i i think it's a question more of communication definitely uh, thank you, thank you, Marina. Any any reactions from from the speakers? My my first a good reaction on that is that uh, we are we are living in a in a fragmented world, and uh, and and while it has an effect on communication, and the problem also is that interactions at different levels in in different sectors, different categories of actors, um, scientists, policymakers, uh, practitioners, SMEs. The I would say the dialogue is not is not really really fluid, but when you are also looking at the chain of uh, information communication from the international national to local, then it's it's even I would don't don't want to say it's even worse, but it's also very problematic. So we have we have to to really reflect on what we could do as a, as a community in a way a multi sector community 
to, to improve um, this kind of uh, fluidity in communication of existing tools. And this is not uh, only, uh, we, cannot, we cannot do only this uh, via research. We can provide actually some uh, suggestions, some recommendations, but uh, there is certainly a need to interact much more closely with policy uh, actors. And here in this case is clearly uh, DG ECHO, and I'm in very close contact with uh, the Union Civil Protection Mechanism uh, colleagues uh, who are really listening very, very closely. They are, they are uh, very, very keen to engage uh, the dialogue with, with the community. But then it's still at European Commission level what will make the difference is that when we will be able to have a, an established dialogue with member states and this passed through the um, committees that are in charge of the implementation of civil protection related policies and maybe uh, the Sendai from a for action people who are uh, in charge of the um, scientific technolo technological advisory group you know the ESTAG, and trying to say well please help us in convincing your government and your local authorities that they need to have uh, to make uh, to change paradigm regarding the communication. So we may, if, even if we have the most beautiful system of communication, providing all solution and so on, if we are not raising risk awareness and convincing people that they have uh, all the interest to follow this, we will not make it. So, so there is a chain of. Uh, I would like to say that it's a partnership with the member states and with the local uh, government, which is not yet established. So it's it's really, as Horst mentioned, it's a holistic uh, approach. Governance is, is holistic. We have to cover everything and all sectors, and it makes the situation extremely complex. But we will be working on that. And I can, I can assure you that it's something that uh, I, I, I feel personally within this program that we can make uh, a, a slight difference, but we will have to be engaged also politically speaking, not only from the research side. And it's where our policy role uh, it can be can be indeed uh, um, uh, more complex, but, but also more efficient. Uh, the, the, the odds say that where is the project at political discussion on failure of governance? There is definitive of lack of research. Well, um, we we uh, there is a project. Well, I, I don't know them by heart. I'm sorry. I confess that I should know them by heart. But there is one uh, one topic which is dealing with with governance, and maybe it's not it's not really focused on failure. We did not we did not pronounce the word failure. We 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 are very very cautious in, in that. There is no failure. There is possible improvement you know we are we are we have to be very diplomatic so so we we have this uh, this i would like to say we the need to complete the, the existing topics i'm very, very keen to to consider that for the uh, program for the next year uh, and i take this opportunity to tell to tell you as audience that if you have ideas that might feed indeed and improve uh, the current uh, research programming as it is standing now. I'm uh, I'm very very interesting to hear your views, even even individually. And you you send me a, a mail or contact me individually. Philippe, if I may, Alessandro yeah, here. Please, yeah. yeah, thank you very much indeed. Please, Alessandro. Oh, grazie. Um, I have seen some some messages there in the chat where they say that um, we need uh, you know a solution available. And on, you know, you know me enough. I'm convinced that research has to keep this rolling life cycle, because it triggers then the development yeah. of the let's say solution for the end user. There is two domain in which I absolutely think we need to work. The more to enable the governments in providing, you know, good instruction in taking good decision, you know, fast and trust. How fast is the information available and how trusted it is? Because the problem is every time we are reluctant to pass on a message because we don't know if we can fully trust it. We cannot measure the trustworthiness of a system if we cannot, if we don't test it. Otherwise you test it on the field. So you test it on the citizen, you test it on the critical infrastructure. This is absolutely impossible. I think these programs are absolutely the enabler of creating this trustworthiness and also our becoming used to rely 
on the trustworthiness of what we get. I just give an example, very, very, very quick. I'll be very quick. I know that in Italy, they're working a lot on, on earthquake because we are quite sensitive to that. You can imagine, you know, uh, I was there when, when there was, you know, the rebuilding of central Italy, you know, I made some visit as, you know, commission stuff. And uh, um, they have, they are developing system to create, to generate shake maps based on the cadastre. So, I mean, they will provide you thanks to the simulation that will be then confirmed something like 8 to 15 minutes after the earthquake, exactly the roads, they can be open, the roads that are inaccessible because they can calculate based on the cadastre map of the, you know, the seismic uh, buildings, you know, whether they have collapsed or not. And uh, I think this is very important. I think this is absolutely important. Sorry, they're calling me below. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, so fast and trust. These, these are my, you know, if I can live with something, you know, how fast we receive the information, how trustworthy it is. Because decision maker needs to, you know, in my case, you know, public warning system, they need to know what to write in that, bro the message is broadcasted to the population. And these absolutely need to be as close to reality as possible. We know that is part of the paradigm and the life cycle of crisis management that you will know exactly how the crisis unfolded at the end. So when you send the message, you have to send it on the best knowledge that you can have in that moment. So we know that it's never perfect. But, to, you know, by improving, you know, uh, how rapidly this system provides some answers to our questions and uh, how trustworthy it is, uh, you know, the elements that they uh use to come up with the results it will definitely improve the way we will do we will use this system and it will improve the way we will send message to the population therefore the population they need a case i mean the population that they have never been exposed to receiving a message from the government saying you need to evacuate they need a case they need a case in which they evacuate and they thinks, oh my goodness, thanks God that they, they delivered the message, because otherwise I would have stayed home and I would... Okay, Alessandro, we understood. Yep, that's, that's it. Philippe, I think you are mute. Yeah, we cannot hear you, Philippe. Maybe meanwhile we can have other people raise their hands uh, to get into this discussion. Uh, Véronique Souley-Revel from uh, EarthLive, um, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Véronique. Yeah. Um, um, some comments. I completely agree with Alessandro about uh, trust and and fast information, and this is how we we are working with our uh, with uh, our uh, this in in our discussions with uh, ECMWF in uh, AGIF. Uh, civil uh, security, civil security in uh, in Portugal, in Italy, um, about different extreme uh, weather uh, events. Uh, this is absolutely key. Um, one other thing I would like to react is the uh, is the fragmented world. Uh, looking at the value chain and and uh, interviewing a lot of stakeholders from the infrastructure in space uh, to the to the uh, uh, radar station to service providers uh, giving the alerts, uh, we see that it's completely fragmented. 
uh, fragmented uh, people um, throughout the complete value chain upstream and downstream. So it's very difficult for us as a, as a startup to to um, to be able to uh, to show what we can provide in complementary to other uh, useful, very useful products. Um, and, and this is absolutely key to understand what is the ecosystem and we, how we can contribute to that existing ecosystem. I'm uh, Afelowski from Agenda Vida Dom. I proceed. Can you hear me, please? Yes, we can hear you. I'm Afelowski from Agenda Vida Dom, the Israeli National Ambulance Service and the Red Cross Society. Uh, I would like to go back to Daniel, uh, Daniel's point and uh, also the issue of trust. Uh, Certainly, it is not an issue of technology. There are a lot of good technologies at, at hand. Uh, I would say there are two uh, main issues that uh, we need to overcome. The most important one is that, especially when we are talking about early warning, early warning, it is not uh, our uh, objective. Our objective is to um, create an action by the public. And uh, if I uh, allude to what uh, Philip was just saying about uh, authorities, authorities, again, are not the objective. Our end target is the citizen at the end of the chain that when we provide her or him with early warning, they do something to protect themselves or mitigate the risk. And here, uh, and the COVID pandemic is uh, showing us uh, the issue of trust or mistrust of citizens in instructions given by authorities and to what degree people would follow our instructions. So we really need to look into in a holistic view and convince uh, people that uh, the science in this case is in their benefit and try and um, bring to them the information in a way that will be not just understood, but also will be trusted and will cause an action. And I think the pandemic is showing us that this is our greatest challenge. Uh, the other thing which uh, I would touch very briefly is the uh, trust of the users in the systems and systems that are for emergency situations really are the kind of things that you know that you have you are not using on a daily basis, you are not used to using those systems, and that delays uh, decision-making by the uh, people who are in charge, because if, it not, if it's not a system that is part of your DNA, it's really hard uh, for you as a human being to trust them in the most critical moments. Thank you. May I take a remark from um, um, to have uh, until until Philip comes back, but it's addressing the um, um, uh, details that uh, he mentioned and that also was uh, said in the in the chat. We need a more broader view uh, that science by itself cannot supply, uh, but it's of course important partner in that. So the uh, the question is, uh, how do we address it? We cannot wait for such. There has been some drivers uh, action. Um, I think that it would be better by DG Home, DG Echo, that they are, uh, make up their mind uh, to do something about it, not just have nice, um, certainly important uh, uh, projects in, in, uh, in science and development, but we know the failures of uh, getting the things in the field to say, I'm not a member of European Union. Uh, uh, and uh, I, uh, there are a lot of people uh, talking, meanwhile, uh, in open about failures and deficits and, and so on. This is not an accusement. This is a typical management issue that we have to t talk about these things that don't work so well. This is management and this is not uh, a thing that, that would uh, an, uh, an accusation, accusation too much. 
but of course it would be better we would have had uh, such solutions uh, uh, years before. Nevertheless, uh, where are the politicians we are, have to talk about? Because the politicians will give us the office, the chair, the desk, the computer, and everything, the men and women power uh, to do it. So uh, that is the decision makers, not we, not, it's not the scientists that make the decisions to go in the right direction. The governance is seen a little bit too narrow. Governments includes all actors, and I do not see it at the moment. One question from uh, my side, Frédéric Martin, our slide. So we see these Horizon Europe uh, calls that are very interesting and might uh, address some of the issues we are talking today. And uh, one point for us would be how to identify uh, organization and already existing consortiums that are answering to, to these uh, Horizon Europe calls and that might be interested in complementing their answer with uh, other part of the project and for instance the one we can bring so is there a way somewhere a kind of database uh, so uh, since that Zoltan uh, has already answered but is there a more centralized database or source of information to have a broader view of all answers being prepared uh, well first of all the the uh... People were looking at companies looking for for uh, uh, DRS partners offering expertise are usually be found in in um, in a link which is reachable from the from the topic of the open call. But to be honest, uh, I'm not managing the funding and tenders portal, so usually you can find companies there. Uh, mm -hmm. If uh, if that helps, I can help you personally, but I I can only only tell you about the consortium in which we are involved in mm -hmm. or invited okay. into i will do it do it happily uh whenever okay. it whenever it helps okay just reach me out okay. on email okay great thank you Zoltan. and You're if anybody else you. has do you, do you, similar do you information hear me do you hear me now yes now do you hear me now okay yeah Sorry, I was I went in Simon and Gap Funkel. You know the sounds, sounds could uh, will not sing, but it's um, so. Yeah, uh, I, I, I did not did not catch all, all the um, all the last uh, questions and response, but for uh, about the third the, uh, um, comment by Gabriel as well uh, regarding the. Uh, um, indeed, there are some possibilities via the portal, but I would like to encourage you to allow us as well uh, to the national contact point network. You know, there is a project called Seren4, and in each country you have a, contact, a national contact point, and they will be able to help you in liaising with different liaising with different uh, uh, proposals. We cannot do that, unfortunately, from the Commission side, mm -hmm. but there are some uh, supporting um, organizations, supporting associations that can help you. So, both on the portal, I don't know how much information you will find on the portal, but also via the uh, National Contact Point Network. And to respond to Gabriel, well, uh, linking series and that, but uh, it's, it's a kind of market digital research will not include this. It's something that uh, have to be reflected. But I would like to say again, come back to the uh, national contact point involvement in this kind of uh, uh, information. And I would like to say also that it might be uh, closely relevant but related to the uh, initiative of some countries, like for example, Spain, Austria, and other countries to develop a national community of users, because this could, could have uh, uh, an impact indeed on sharing views and helping um, uh, proposals in the DRS area. 
Um, I would like also to say to Rowan that uh, an Horizon um, projects on integrated improvement in disaster risk treatment and response are actually progressing. There are a lot of information that are being uh, developed by different ongoing projects. The problem is that it's uh, rather a problem very often of communication. The way um, the way it is uh, communicated to the different policy makers and to the different practitioners. And here we are facing clearly uh, a difficulty in uh, formatting the information. We are still learning. Um, policymakers will not read uh, scientific reports. They will uh, look at briefing material, which are very, very closely related to, to policy implementation needs. They will not look at the reports and the practitioners the same. They will not look at science project from pro, from coming uh, well report coming from scientific project. We need to learn uh, on how to to target to tailor our uh, our information better. Uh, to Reim, I would like to say that citizen risk awareness is becoming at the core of uh, our uh, research programming in Horizon Europe. You will see that in our uh, program there are some several topics which are integrated in looking at the citizen dimension. And if you look at the mission on climate change adaptation, you have a very, very strong component on uh, citizen uh, awareness. And we know that it is where we can uh, actually make a, dis uh, a, 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 um, a difference. We were, like uh, what, what Alessandro mentioned about earthquake in Italy, uh, th th there are people living in risky area that know what, what they need to do in the case of an event like that. Japanese population know, know also uh, what they have to do in, in case of earthquake. We don't have this culture of risk in Europe uh, in many, in, for many different risks. So we need to, to imagine how do, do we indeed integrate this maybe in, in even school curricula, university curricula, uh, common practices and so on. Uh, countries are more advanced than others but we need to have a kind of harmonization. So this is uh, something which is very important to us and we will try to make, to make progress in this respect. And well, Javier said about, uh, spoke about critical infrastructure. I do not have uh, any uh, doubt that we can do something and we, we need to, um, uh, to ensure that indeed information can be, can be shared in this respect. And that we are looking at cascading effects. I'm, I'm reflecting on this. Uh, Javier, if you have any kind of uh, inputs that, that could be interesting to me in the form of report of papers, I will be happy to, to read that. And it's in, and it's the same for other questions because I'm, I need to have your input uh, for helping me to, uh, to, to, to develop the work program, uh, the, the work program uh, of the next uh, years. Uh, and while Claudio, you, while you speak about open data, obviously they are key, um, uh, key issue, and we need to indeed to, uh, to 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 get access to open data. Well, we are here uh, looking into uh, private and uh, copyright ownership issue, which is very, which are very very difficult difficult to tackle. Message to be passed passed maybe to DGECO because it's a matter of regulation, it's a matter of uh, uh, establishing. Uh, a policy background that would actually encourage uh, this open uh, data to be to be uh, to be made uh, operational to any private uh, companies that needs them uh, to have a better, for example, impact forecasting or or um, or, or, or res preparedness uh, response. So, so, so this is for me quite a quite a, a lot of useful comments I heard. Uh, today, a lot of uh, a lot of feedbacks that are very very useful to us as a research programming officer. I would like to to uh, invite you um, if you have any uh, suggestion, recommendations, uh, background paper uh, that might be uh, helpful to me regarding uh, work program preparation. To send that to me by by mail, I will I will share my, my mail here. You certainly have it, uh, but I share that to you again and please don't hesitate to interact with me um, uh, individually because the next uh, weeks to come I will be very busy with this, uh, indeed preparation for the next two years uh, work programming. Um, are there any any further uh, questions uh, um, to, to the speakers or response 
response to to uh, their uh, reactions that you might have before we close the workshop. Yeah, data procurement and access are key for private private companies. We are we are looking at procurement in the area of fight of uh, against crime and tourism. Very few on the disaster risk reduction area, and uh, it's something that I was reflecting upon. It's something really that uh, I lacked a little bit some background information, but uh, certainly uh, there is a good good opportunity to do that in our program. To have to have PCP um, PCP project topics to be proposed actually to the member states because obviously the member states will be deciding uh, at the end of the day on the program topics to be to be selected. I would like to, if there are no further reaction, I would like to say that uh, regarding series, I'm really desperate to have only virtual meetings because it's. Uh, we are lack uh, this energy of uh, dialoguing, I would say, uh, uh, in, in presence. So uh, uh, I think that the recorded the recording will be made available. I will check with my colleague, but in principle, it will be it will be made available, Gabriela. So I would like to say that we will uh, we still have a, a difficulty to organize physical meetings because because of the uh, sanitary uh, restrictions, but well. From the Commission side, it's a little bit strange because we we cannot really go in mission until the end of December. Well, okay, but it does not mean that um, events cannot be organized. And it will be the case at the end of September on the 29th and 30th. There will be a CBRN uh, event organized by three projects, um, and where the Commission will participate. It will be under the umbrella of series, but it's not organized directly uh, by the Commission, but uh, we will be uh, considering this as a series event. And I'm working with uh, projects from the uh, DRS 1 and 2, that is societal resilience and uh, technologies for first responders to see whether we might uh, have come some, um, some possibilities to get um, support from their dissemination budget to, to keep uh, an event uh, with a mix of uh, virtual and physical presence at uh, the mid of December. So I will keep you informed about this. I'm envisaging to have a meeting uh, tailoring societal resilience and technologies for first responders on the 13th to 15th of uh, December this year, and we will be programming event um, uh, for 2022 uh, for, for the series DRS part. Um, I would like also to stress that more and more in uh, Horizon Europe, we have put in our work program that um, topics, well, projects are much welcome to uh, interact with series and even organize events which are related to series. And this can be uh, taken in their budget as dissemination event. And certainly in the future, um, we, we will be very uh, I would say relieved that this kind of event be organized by senior well, projects working in synergies rather than centrally at the European Commission. We will be very strongly involved in these discussions, but not, I would say, in charge of uh, organizing systematically this, this event. And it can be done uh, in uh, different places, not necessarily only uh, in Brussels. So this is my, my message as uh, my concluding uh, message. And I will be very happy to get your your feedback on, on, on that. Uh, and I would like also to say that I will be working until December on um, a report that will be providing key information collected from all the series workshops that we have organized before summer. And it has they have been quite numerous. There have been some nine to ten uh, workshops which have really delivered some key information, uh, key information on projects. I will try to have a, more, a compilation made at the end of the year with policy updates as, uh, uh, as well. Uh, that could be a kind of uh, series report on the arrest that will be made publicly available. And I, well, uh, it would be a try. I don't pretend to have it, uh, I would say, uh, tailor made to, to your needs, but I will make this try and I will be very interested and happy to get your feedback. 
So with this, yeah, thank you, thank you, Javier. Yeah, I know the the PC, which is uh, indeed uh, indeed interesting. Uh, I thank you very much for your participation, for your uh, for exchanging information. This is always very very interesting. Um, uh, link to the Siberian event. Yes, uh, I can provide that to you. It's the uh, University Catholic de Louvain. You know the 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 contact is uh, Olga uh, Vibornova. Just send me a mail. I will send you the uh, the the contact the contact of the organizers. So thank you very much. It has been very interesting a journey for me this morning. I've learned a lot, and I hope that uh, these exchanges have enabled you to also to 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 have some ideas and uh, I would say of a possibility of partnership. And I look forward to to see you in presence next time. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye guys. Thank you. Bye. And thanks, Philip, for the organizing. Great job. Thank you. It's, it's great pleasure. Great pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.